All right, welcome to the Young Turks. Uh... All right, we got a hell of a show for you guys today. Um, some really uh, s stories that will be hard to, to stomach, to, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, they're in the news, uh, and we got to cover them, and I'll do them in the first segment here in a little bit. But before we get to the tough news, uh, let me give you some good news. The New Jersey Senate has just passed the Wolfpack Resolution 22 to 10. There we go. Okay. Okay, although that shouldn't go over me, that should go over uh, the good volunteers at Wolfpack, specifically in New Jersey. We'll talk more about it on tomorrow's show. I'll give you details. Uh, New Jersey uh, still has the House to go. It has already passed the committee in the House. Uh, we just need one final House vote uh, for it to pass entirely out of New Jersey, and that would be the fourth state. Oh, I, I know. It can't be done. It can't be done. Don't, don't bother. Don't bother. No, it, it, nothing can be done until it's done, right? I tell you, man, I want everybody here to, to note for the record, okay? And because after we pass the amendment, I guarantee it, people are going to say, well, but that was obvious. Everybody wanted that amendment. I mean, 95% of the country wanted it. That wasn't hard, <laughs> right? That's what they're going to say, right? <laughs> All right. Um, the, I, the volunteers there, man, are unbelievable, unbelievable. You, you want to you have fun in your life? You want to be a warrior? You want to be part of something important? You want to be part of history? Wolf-pack.com, man. Uh, it, an opportunity like this does not come along uh, every day. So if you lived in other eras and, uh, and we didn't have this kind of fight, you know, you continue to sit on your couch and eat your Cheetos or whatever good folks on their couch eat. For me, it's a sub. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, and I enjoyed sitting on my couch and doing nothing. Uh, but we have a unique opportunity now. Money in politics has killed our democracy on the national level. Absolutely murdered it. It does not exist. And you just saw it uh, in the omnibus bill. Nobody, no actual citizen is in favor of the banks gambling with our depositor money. No one who says, yes, take my money, gamble with it, and you keep all the winnings. You keep all the winnings, but if you lose, don't worry, I'll pay for it. There's not a single actual American citizen, human being, who's in favor of that. And it passed easily through the House and Senate, and President Obama was largely in favor of it. He claims he wasn't in favor of it, but he pushed it through. Okay, So that's the state of our democracy. Uh, but what they did not calculate is that we would counterattack. Wolf-Pack.com. Okay, I'll tell you more on tomorrow's show. All right, now uh, let's have just one more piece of fun before we get to the tough news. Uh, so let's go to Fox News. They're always fun. Uh, Martha McCollum is going to be uh, filling in for Megyn Kelly, and of course she's outraged by President Obama. Why? Fill in the blank. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it Benghazi? No. Today they've laid off a Benghazi, a little bit IRS scandal, Fast and Furious. No. Okay, no, the latest thing is um, now uh, North Korea has apparently threatened us, and uh, that's why Sony pulled the movie, the interview, uh, out of theaters, and the theater chains had already pulled out anyway. And whose fault is this? Is it Sony's fault? Is it Kim Jong un's fault? No. As usual with Fox News, I would say it's Kim Jong un believable, but it's not. It's very believable. Of course, they found the real culprit, President Obama. Take it away. I know there have been sources saying that the FBI has essentially said that it is North Korea. We basically know that it is. And the question becomes then, what should the response be? Because this is a very serious issue. If, a, if North Korea is allowed to do this, if they're allowed to essentially target private corporations on U.S. soil, maybe even private citizens, it has a very real chilling effect on our speech on top of being a form of cyber terrorism. So this is something that requires a robust and, and dedicated response from the White House. I'm not sure we're going to get it, though. I think right now they're uh, waiting to see I what mean, happens. So far, we haven't heard boo from the White House. I mean, you might expect, when you think about after 9-11 and the concerns that there would be further threats, the message was always, go on, live your life, do what you're going to do, go to the movies, go shopping. 
Okay, why hasn't he told us to go shopping yet? What kind of president is this? Uh, and he has not told us to go to the movies. We have not heard boo from this president. Now, let's go to three hours earlier on ABC's World News Tonight. Watch. With respect to this specific case, we're investigating it. We're taking it seriously. Uh, the FBI should uh, you know, have more information over the next several days about the suspected identity of the hackers and whether there was a state sponsor of it or not. Um, we see no credible evidence, though, of uh, any serious threat to theaters or some sort of terrorist attack against theaters that are screening the, the particular movie at, uh, at issue. Um, you know, we'll be vigilant. If we see something that we uh, think is serious and credible, uh, then we'll alert the public. Uh, but for now, uh, my recommendation would be that uh, people go to the movies. Oops. It appears he did say something. In fact, he said the very same thing that you said he should have said. All right, give me a Martha McCullum here. I think this is well earned. <laughs> Sorry, Martha. You might want to do your research a little bit. But that's the, but it's you know it's indicative. Other than the, the fact that it's funny and it, it, I mean they literally could not be more wrong on Fox News. It's indicative of at Fox News, President Obama's always wrong and he's always at fault, no matter what happened. And even if he did the very thing that they are uh, asking him to do, still at fault. Obama's wrong. That's the answer. I forgot the question. <laughs> it's Fox News in a nutshell. Okay, uh, so now we move on to serious stories. In Peshawar, Pakistan, we had a horrible uh, terror attack by the Taliban. Over 140 people killed in a school. Uh, 130 of them were kids ages 12 to 16. Uh, we now have some of the pictures that have come in uh, from that attack, uh, and it is, of course, tough to look at. So. Uh, it was a school that had all those young uh, students in it, and um, the Taliban had the nerve to say that they didn't target the younger of those students. Now, the reality is witnesses say that they fired indiscriminately into uh, rooms, and that's just so hard to look at. Uh, the auditorium where the kids were gathered, and apparently they knew there was going to be a gathering, they fired into at length and killed over 100 kids in just that one room. Uh, and as you see, uh, the bullet holes there as well. You can picture the terror that's going on inside there. But we don't show you this to talk about uh, how there were victims in this and how scared they must have been. There's no question about that. But we actually are showing you this. God, it's tough to look at. Um, to tell you about a hero uh, in the midst of all of this. It's a teacher by the name of Afsha Ahmed. She's only 24 herself. So the gunmen come in, and um, she recognizes the threat right away. And of course, the kids are more scared than you could imagine. And that's when uh, one of the students who survived the attack, uh, Irfanullah, uh, says this. He said, the gunmen entered our classroom, and as we were sitting with our teacher, she seemed to understand what was going on before we did, because she immediately stood up and prevented the terrorists from targeting us. Obviously, some of the students, including this one, survived because of the actions of the teacher. The student goes on to say, her last words to the terrorists were, you must kill me first, because I will not see my students' bodies lying in front of me. She was so brave. This story does not have a good ending. Um, not only did they kill her, but they killed her in uh, an unbelievably vicious way. Irfanula explains, the next thing we knew she was on fire. Even while burning, she shouted at us to run away and find refuge. There are real heroes in this world. Obviously, Afsha Ahmed is one of them. Uh, because of her actions, some of the students got away and uh, were safe. There's also real terror in this world. Fundamentalism has brought us great, great pain throughout the world. And Understand, by the way, the kids killed here were also Muslim. The teacher, Afsha Ahmed, also Muslim. The problem isn't Muslims. The problem is Muslim fundamentalists who are doing these killings. 
Now, obviously, people believe in the same religion and react completely differently based on the circumstances. But I don't care what your political or religious ideology is. Let's just take a moment to appreciate a person who gave everything she possibly could to the very last second of her life. And her student says at the end, I feel so selfish for running away instead of trying to find a way to save her. She's my hero. She was like a superwoman. Who will teach us now? We have got to put aside the fundamentalists. We have got to. I, I don't know that the answer is more bombs. Violence leads to more violence, and round and round we go. Uh, but I do know that tragedies are like, like this are so hard to stomach. And I've been thinking about Afshar Ahmed ever since I read this story. And you can't match, match that heroism. You, you just... It's amazing what some people in the world will do. And bless her heart, and thank God she was alive when she was, and God knows how many lives she saved. So in the midst of terror, there is also moments of incredible humanity. And we, of course, all thank her for it, and our thoughts are with her family and loved ones. Okay, now from a tough story abroad uh, to a tough story uh, here at home. Uh, and it's a story from the past, but a very, very important one that you need to know. This is the story of George Stinney. Uh, he was just 14 years old when he was taken by the authorities and charged with a crime. They said that he had killed 11-year-old Betty June Binnaker and 8-year-old Mary Emma Thames. This was back in the year 1944. Now, it turns out he did not do any of those things, and just yesterday, he was exonerated. Finally, the state of South Carolina said he didn't do it. We should not have convicted him. But they didn't just convict him, they executed him. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, unfortunately, about how that happened, because it's important that you know uh, what happened in this country and the remnants of that culture and that history. So first, let's show you, George. Uh, you got to understand the context here. He was just 90 pounds. He was 5 feet 2. He was 14 years old. They claim that he uh, killed those girls and threw them in a ditch and that he had the capability of doing this. Now, did they have any evidence on him? Well, they had three cops uh, who said he did it and said that he confessed to it. Did they have any witnesses? No. Did they have any physical evidence? No. Did the cops write down the confession at the time? No. Were there any blacks on the jury in South Carolina back in 1944? No. They had uh, a law at the time that said you had to be a voter to be on a jury. But blacks weren't allowed to vote, so they weren't allowed to be on juries. In fact, almost no one there was black at all in the courtroom. Uh, 81 days after he was arrested and charged with this, they brought him to trial. The trial lasted about two and a half hours, during which his white defense attorney, who had not worked a criminal case before and who was going to be running for political office and needed votes in that area, did not present a single defense witness outside of Stinney. He didn't even cross-examine the police. Stinney says that he never confessed. Well, now we know he didn't do the crime. The police bring no evidence except they say, yeah, trust us, he confessed earlier. No cross-examination. The trial lasted two and a half hours. The jury took 10 minutes to convict him. And then he was led uh, to death row in uh, Clarendon County, South Carolina. We actually have a picture of him being led to death row. Uh, let me show you that. Uh, he was carrying a Bible. By the way, just if you're not absolutely clear yet uh, that he didn't do it, uh, historian in 2004 took this case on and uh, investigated it further and found out that there was a wealthy white family in the area who said that the real culprit did it 
deathbed confession and said that he had killed the two young girls. And a member of that family was part of the process that picked Stinney as the real culprit. It's impossible to know now, looking back 70 years, who knew and didn't know what exactly happened. Really, they were sure that this 14-year-old had done it, this 90-pound 14-year-old. Did they care that someone else had done it and was going to get away with the murders? They didn't care. They strapped him into Old Sparky. That's literally what the electric chair in South Carolina was called. And then, just as the story is horrible, it's about to get worse. Since he was so young, uh, they couldn't strap him in right. They took the Bible he was carrying and made him use it as a booster seat. And then Joy James, an author, writes, the mask covering his face slipped off because the mask didn't fit. It was an adult's mask. Revealing his wide open, tearful eyes and saliva coming from his mouth. The first jolt had, had not worked. After two more jolts of electricity, the boy was dead. His family was not at the execution. His family was not at the trial. Why? Because they told the family, if you don't leave town immediately, we're going to lynch you all. You want to talk about terror. You know, we talk about terrorism today in America. This was true terror. And they weren't there for their 14-year-old boy. The Associated Press says the rest of the family didn't see the teen again until his funeral when Stinney's body, burned from the electric chair, was put in an open casket. South Carolina has executed 289 people in the 20th century, and 82% of them were black, according to the Death Penalty Information Center. This legacy is not just about George Stinney and what was done to him. Now, finally, the state of South Carolina says they were wrong. He didn't do it. <sighs> that legacy continues to this day. Do you know that there were seven death penalty exonerations, not in 1944, today, in the year 2014? Seven people who were set to be executed, and it turned out they didn't do it. Let me show you the pictures of those seven folks. Yep, six out of the seven just happened to be African American. History rains down on us through the generations. This is not over. In fact, for those guys who were on death row, it took on average 30 years to clear their names. 30 years they sat on death row when they were perfectly innocent. George Stinney was also perfectly innocent, but they needed a scapegoat. And in this country, especially in the South, when they needed a scapegoat, you always knew where they were going to turn. Doesn't mean things haven't gotten better, but we're certainly not at the end of that process. And we've all got to learn from this and work together to make a better system that works for all of us so that we can all proudly call it our justice system. We're not there yet. Young Turks. Honey, Young Turks. Now, um, we're not off the heavy topics yet, don't worry, not another uh, one of the stories involving death. This only involves torture, okay? Uh, it's at least written by a good guy here. Um, so, uh, let me tell you the story uh, uh, that Think Progress brings to us here. So, now we know that the Senate put out the torture report and um, there's been a debate in this country as to whether uh, the CIA was justified in doing the torture, whether it actually was torture or not. Uh, unfortunately, we showed you a poll earlier in the week uh, saying that a uh, majority of Americans uh, believe that it was justified. And, um, and, and a plurality of them even said they didn't want to see the report. 
nah, just go ahead and do it in our name, but just don't tell us. It's amazing, right? Well, uh, Think Progress looked into a little bit more, and Jack Jenkins wrote a very good story about this, and about how Christians should react and how they, in fact, in reality, reacted to this news. Turns out, Christians polled were actually more likely than the general public to support torture. Now, this is quite ironic. He's going to point out how ironic it is in a second. But first, let's go to Sarah Posner's uh, work uh, in terms of identifying how the numbers broke down. Just 39% of white evangelicals believe the CIA's treatment of detainees amounted to torture, with 53% of white non-evangelical pro Protestants and 45% of white Catholics agreeing with that statement. So a minority of white evangelicals are saying it's torture even though there was anal rape involved, one person that was killed, and the list goes on and on, right? Um, agreeing, okay, 69% of the white evangelicals believe the CIA treatment was justified. Justify 69% of people who are the most die-hard Christians in the country, compared to just 20% who said it was not. A full three-quarters of white non-evangelical Protestants outnumber 20% of their brethren in saying that CIA treatment was justified. White Catholics believe the treatment was justified by a 66 to 23 margin. So, as you can see here, all of those different groups uh, that are in different brackets of the Christian religion uh, polling very high, at the very high end of the entire American spectrum. Uh, yes, the enhanced interrogation techniques were justified, including, by the way, I mean, we gloss over it, but we kept beating them, and we punched them, we slapped them, we threw them against the wall, we hung them from the walls, <laughs> we put them in coffins, did mock executions, said we were going to rape their mothers and kill their children. Those were not idle threats, at least they were not meant to be idle threats to the detainees. The detainees took them very, very seriously, especially given what had just happened to them. We did these things called rectal hydrations and feedings, which of course were not necessary. And so hence they put a hose in people's backside, and that's what we normally call rape. Okay, uh, And all that was done, and apparently in overwhelming numbers, the Christians in this country say, go get them. Now, Jack Jenkins is going to point out the irony of this. He says, these numbers are appalling, theologically repugnant, and frankly confusing. Christianity is a tradition whose Savior, Jesus Christ, was arrested, wrongfully accused, and tortured. Things the Gospel stories make clear were gross mistreatments. Christ was also crucified, a form of capital punishment that was specifically designed to torture right up until the moment of death. This was something I've been saying for a long time, but I'm not a Christian, right? It, I pointed out, uh, and but I, I read the Bible, I read the New Testament. <laughs> Everybody knows how that story ends, right? Jesus was literally tortured to death. How could any Christian be in favor of torture? How could you look at the things that they did to these detainees? By the way, over 20% of them whom were innocent. I mean, if you believe in the story of Jesus Christ, they were innocent just like Jesus. It's not, oh, come on, not like Jesus, that's an insult. No, no, just like Jesus. They did, I mean, they weren't prophets, they weren't the Son of God or, or anything, but they didn't do it. They had the wrong guy. One guy they kidnapped, turns out, had the same name as another guy they were looking for. They tortured him for months. And then they're like, oh, sorry, oops, wrong guy. And then they just drop him off in a different country entirely and run away. That happened for... Over 20% of the detainees that they tortured. Ah, sorry, we got the wrong guy. Christians say, ah, that's okay. Now, mind you, it's not all Christians. And actually, Christian leadership on this has been very good. Even the Southern Baptists, who sometimes you know, uh, can be in favor of the death penalty, which is also not correct according to the uh, you know, Bible. <laughs> I don't know where they draw that line, right? But, but in this case, even Richard Land, who I disagree with greatly on political matters, say that this is torture and obviously as a Christian you should be dead set against it. But the majority of Christians on the, in the country, unfortunately overwhelmingly so, are not in that camp. And uh, Jenkins points out, in fact, this is the height of irony, Christians often wear a symbol of this torture, the cross, around their necks, supposedly as a reminder of the tragedy of Christ's death. 
And finally, he concludes the piece by saying, ultimately, the results of this poll begs a troubling question. If Christians cannot stand against torture, the very tool used to kill Jesus, what do they stand for? It is an excellent question. I'm not a Christian, so I can't answer it. But if you're a Christian out there and you're in favor of these techniques, you tell me, how on God's green earth can you wear that cross around your neck and be in favor of torture? Okay. All right, now we move forward, uh, fortunately, to more bad news. We're going to get to slightly lighter foreign policy in a second. <laughs> okay. Now, but we're getting lighter as we go. This is only about how disastrous uh, the w income gap in, is in America and the wealth gap as well. So, oh boy. Okay. So. New numbers out from the Pew Research Center about the wealth gap in America. Uh, the numbers, as usual, are not good. Uh, let me show you the trends that have happened in this country uh, from 1983 to the year 2013, which is the years that they track. This is a comparison of upper income median net growth compared to uh, middle income families. So back in 1983, the number was 3.4, the gap between upper and middle income households. Today it's at 6.6, .6. it's at a record high. So upper income growth is 6.6 .6 times greater than middle income growth. So the rich are getting much richer and at twice the rate they were back in 1983. So it has not abated at all. Now remember in the 1980s we were told that it's okay, we're going to do Reaganomics and we're going to give a lot of breaks to the rich. We're going to give tax cuts. We're going to do, you know, be give subsidies to corporations and and all these different advantages, right? But it's okay because it's going to trickle down to you. Well, the evidence is in. It's not like 1980 was a couple of years ago. We've had a long, long time to look at the numbers. Now it's been about 33 years, and in this period, we're looking at 30 years there that was tracked. It has not trickled down. I mean, of course, it depends on your definition of trickle down. Something's trickled down on our head, right? But the money has gone completely up. Now, that's compared to middle income people. Now, get a load of this comparison. Those same upper income families are now nearly 70 times wealthier than low income families, also a record gap. 70 times. Okay. Now, look, I'm a capitalist. Um, you know, I, I, I want to be rich, uh, I believe in the American dream. Uh, and as I look at some of these uh, countries, um, I think, okay, uh, I'm not sure I'd want to live in Denmark, okay, given uh, their structure and how uh, things are incentivized there. I'll show you that in a little bit. Uh, but this is outrageous. This is beyond all bounds of reason. Okay, let me show you what's happened in our so-called economic recovery lately. So uh, the income wealth uh, between 2010 and 2013. Well, okay, good. Upper income, uh, we have had an economic recovery, has gone from $595,300 to all the way up to $639,400. Now, that's not your income, that's your wealth. Okay, I should be clear about that. So that's the wealth for the, for the upper income brackets. Okay, so that went up. Great, we have an economic recovery. Well, when you look at uh, middle income, not so much. Uh, middle income families were absolutely flat as $96,500. And when you look at lower income families, not only did they not go up, they dropped from 10,500 to 9,300. So we're, and that's under President Obama. That's under our so-called economic recovery. Where's the recovery for us? If you're middle income, no recovery at all. And if you're lower income, you've lost ground during the recovery, the so-called recovery. Gee, I wonder why Democrats couldn't get people out to vote. I mean, you delivered in spades for the rich, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, if you're doing an economic recovery, the rich should get richer too. But so should the middle class, and so should the poor. But it didn't happen for the rest of us. So that's why people couldn't get excited about President Obama. It's not that complicated, and it has nothing to do with all these fake scandals that Republicans talk about. It's not like people are like, oh, I really got to go vote against Obama if you're a middle class family who's an independent and is not knee deep in Fox News or Republican or Democratic politics. 
They weren't out there going like, oh, Benghazi, let me go vote. No, they were out there like, where, where, where's the recovery? I don't see it because they didn't, because they literally didn't see it. It didn't come to them. Now, one more chart. Now, unfortunately, we don't have it for you here. So you're going to have to take my word for it. I don't know where it went. Anyway, uh, but it's an important part of the story. When you look at this chart, you've got uh, three different categories here. Um, bottom 90%, top 10%, and then top 1%. And it ranges from Denmark to the United States. When you look at Denmark's chart, uh, the bottom 90% uh, actually have a very solid share of the income growth from 1975 to 2007. Uh, the top 1%, not that much. The t top 10% have about 10% of the share, which is amazing, right? Um, and then as you go through Portugal, Sweden, Spain, etc., uh, the top 1% and the top 10% get more and more and more, uh, but it's not really out of control until you get to Australia, UK, Canada, and the US. But look at the US numbers. They are stunning. This is share of income growth from 1975 to 2007. About 50%, almost half of the entire growth went to just the top 1%. And the top 10% got about 80% of the growth, 80% of the growth. And when you look at all the countries combined, you see that it didn't have to be so. It's not like this is what normally happens, this is a normal evolution of economics. No, it's how you set the rules. Denmark set the rules one way, France set them another way, they got different results. We set them a third way and we got dramatically different results. And it's obvious from the numbers that we set the rules in favor of the rich. Of course, and it never trickled out. It wasn't supposed to trickle down. This chart is exactly what they intended. They don't look at this and say, oh, shoot, look at that income inequality. They look at this and think, mission accomplished. Look, man, you don't have to be a wild-eyed socialist to say that chart is insane. I, I, I believe in capitalism. I, I run a corporation. <laughs> the Young Turks is an LLC. It's a corporation, technically. I'm a business owner. I, I, I want the rich to get a good share of the income, definitely. But this is insane. This is insane. How can you look at it and not see that it's insane? 80% of the income goes, goes to just the top 10%. 50% basically goes to just the top 1%. It doesn't have to be that way. When they tell you that that's what capitalism is, they're lying to you. All those other countries have really strong uh, economies, uh, companies, you name it. They, they're, not, they're not in squalor, they're doing perfectly fine. It's just that the income is shared in different ways and everybody who works shares in it at least to some degree. How can anybody look at all these numbers and say that trickle-down economics worked? No person who's actually honest can say that. So if you hear someone on TV telling you that, you know that they're doing it for a purpose, because they're in the bracket who made out like bandits, and they don't want you to know the truth. Okay. Now, yes, finally, foreign policy. Okay. <laughs> Believe it or not, on today's show, foreign policy is the light news. Okay. Wasn't yesterday lovely when we were making fun of all those politicians, the Republicans and the Democrats? We're having a good old time. All right, anyway. So President Obama uh, has uh, put uh, forward a new set of rules that's going to apply for Cuba. We're easing some of the sanctions and the embargo a little bit. We have not lifted it. Some of the travel restrictions, some of the money that you can send back. And yes, you might even be able to bring Cuban cigars back. Of course, uh, that makes conservatives very angry. It makes uh, almost all the Cuban Americans in the Senate and in the House very, very angry, including Menendez, who's a Democrat, and then of course Ted Cruz and, is, and Marco Rubio are livid over this. All the, almost all the Republican uh, presidential candidates, Jeb Bush, of course used to be governor of Florida, they all have to pretend to be outraged because 54 years of the embargo, and it was this close to working. We just, if we had just given it a couple more days, I'm sure uh, we would have won. Uh, now, of course, no one in their right mind can make that claim. Uh, but those guys are not in their right mind. Someone who clearly is, is President Jimmy Carter. It's not surprising that he would be in favor of this. Let's uh, listen to the former president, and then I want to give you something you might not have known. 
no doubt that the best, uh, the beneficiaries of this uh, primarily will be the Cuban people. There are about 11 or 12 million of them. And they've been living under not only a dictatorship that has deprived them of basic rights, but also they've been living under a United States imposed embargo or sanctions that have deprived them from equal trade with their nearest neighbor in the, in the world. And so these are the kind of things that have uh, long been overdue. And I'm very uh, proud and grateful that uh, President Obama has shown such good wisdom and also, uh, I'd say, political courage in taking this long overdue step. Uh, now, uh, that makes a, a lot of sense because hurting the Cuban people hasn't really helped our cause. It hasn't weakened the Castro regime. If anything, they've remained as strong as they've ever been. They've been in power all of these decades. And the sanctions only made their people poorer and gave them less of an ability to fight back. So one, one more clip here from Jimmy Carter. For a long time, I've said that the best way to bring democracy and freedom to Cuba, I'm sure in small uh, incremental steps, is to have full uh, opportunity for Americans to go there, to trade, to, go, to, to invest, uh, to let the Cuban people see clearly that we're not the villains in their economic plight. It's primarily brought about by the inadvised policies of communism. But uh, I think this will open up the Cuban people to the realization that they need to move toward more freedom and more democracy. Uh, Raul Castro, compared to Fidel, has done a good bit to bring about openness and freedom in economic terms. Not very much, of course, in political terms. But I think this will come inevitably. See, another great point by the former president saying it allows uh, the Castro regime to say, oh, it's those evil Americans who are keeping you down with their sanctions. If they didn't have that, well, you know, our economy would be blooming and everything would be lovely, which we know under communism is not likely to be the case. So as we see in China and Vietnam, they start heading straight towards capitalism and more and more freedom. The more we open up those countries, we should do likewise in Cuba because it will actually help our cause, not hurt our cause. Now, here's the interesting part. President Carter began to normalize relations with Cuba in 1977 when he was president. And of course, there's a lot of pushback. And there was a couple of different events that happened. For example, Cuba uh, took more military action in Africa, and there was a flood of Cuban refugees in 1980, and he had to slow the process down. Uh, but he wanted to continue on that path, but he lost the election, and Ronald Reagan came in in 1981 and completely reversed that direction. Isn't that interesting? Elections definitely have consequences. If Jimmy Carter was reelected, we might have gone towards lifting the sanctions and embargo decades ago. We would have saved 34 years of failure, 34 years of punishing the Cuban people. It's not like it worked. It's not like the Castro regime was toppled. We didn't punish the Castros. The Castros are exactly where they were before. They're perfectly happy and content and in charge. And that includes all the Cuban leadership. So you didn't hurt those guys at all. All you did was punish the Cuban people for 34 years when you didn't need to. Sometimes elections have consequences. We could have made change that error a long, long time ago. Instead, we kept going in this ridiculous direction. Now, Jimmy Carter saying that is not surprising. One of the Republican presidential possible candidates saying it, a little surprising. That's Rand Paul. Let's go to him. You know, the 50-year embargo with Cuba just hadn't worked. I mean, if the goal was regime change, uh, it sure doesn't seem to be working. And probably it punishes the people more than the regime because the regime can blame the embargo for hardship. And if there's open trade, I think the, the people will see what it's like to uh, uh, all the things that we produce under capitalism. So in the end, I think probably opening up uh, Cuba is a good idea. Whoa, hey, there's a little bit of breath of fresh air. Now, there's a lot I don't agree with Rand Paul on, but at least he's willing to think for himself and step outside the box a little bit. Now, his father, Ron Paul, was also in favor of lifting the sanctions, and, uh, and at least he's willing to have the courage to step out and say, no, I don't agree with the rest of the Republicans. This thing clearly didn't work. I mean, hello, Earth to Republicans. Did you really think it was going to work in year 55? One more from Rand Paul. The bottom line is even the Cuban community is kind of coming around on this. If you uh, poll or interview younger Cubans, over half of young Cuban Americans are actually are for opening up uh, trade with Cuba. Many of the farmers in our country are for opening it up because uh, you know that we would have uh, more things. You know, we do such a great job producing food in our country. It'd be just one more area that we can uh, sell our food to. 
All right, and an economic argument there, not just for the Cuban people, but also for the American people. Look, you got to give credit where credit is due. Rand Paul is right on this issue, and he's right to take a bold step that a lot of Republicans would be too scared to take. And it's funny that we got to give credit to Republicans for the most obvious things. Is there, I mean, really, is there anybody in the country who says the embargo was about to work? No one in their right mind can possibly believe that. But we have to give enormous kudos to a Republican for saying the most obvious thing in the world. And he deserves it, because within this political context, it still took courage. All right. When we come back, the Russian bear. You're going to love an analogy by Putin. We'll be right back. All right, back on the Young Turks. All right, final couple of stories here. Okay. Uh, now, the ruble's taking a huge hit in Russia, so the economy is in a lot of trouble. Uh, lost a record amount in one day, recovered a little bit uh, later in the week, but not by much. Uh, Vladimir Putin, who, of course, leader of Russia, did a three hour press conference, which is what he normally does before the holidays. It's a nice way to kick off the holidays. <laughs> three hours with Putin. Uh, and in that time, he said, look, it's going to take us at least two years to recover, which is stunning, right? It's quite a thing to say we had such an economic jolt in this last week that it'll take us two years to get beyond it. Now, some of the reasons for that are because of the sanctions that the West has put on them because uh, of the Ukraine and Crimea situation. And, uh, and the other reason is the dramatic drop in price of oil. Uh, 50% of Russia's revenues come from oil, and oil has dropped from about $110 to $60 a barrel. Okay, so that's a heavy, heavy blow for a country that is very dependent on selling oil abroad. And, um, and they recognize that, and Putin in his press conference said that he would um, work to make Russia less dependent on oil. Okay, now, let's get to the fun stuff. So that's substantive, and then uh, you have to see the theatrics behind Putin, because that's where the, uh, the fun comes into play. Uh, Associated Press explains that Putin accompanied his message with trademark images of Russian pride, with videos showing him surrounded by Sochi Olympic athletes, petting a baby tiger, and greeting Russian cosmonauts. This guy's hilarious, man. Like, he's really taking Dosecki's commercials to heart. He's trying to be the most interesting man in the world. Here's me petting it. I don't often uh, pet tigers, but when I do, they're baby tigers. <laughs> okay, anyway. So, no pictures of him riding a bear, although that does exist on the internet. It's not real. All right. Now, speaking of bears, uh, he starts talking about this bear analogy, of course. That's a symbol for Russia. He says, sometimes I think maybe it would be better for a bear to sit quiet rather than chasing around the forest after piglets. To sit eating berries and honey instead. Maybe they will leave it in peace. They will not. Because they will always try to put him on a chain. And as soon as they succeed in doing so, they will tear out his fangs and his claws. That accent is indescribable and also unbearable. <laughs> I'm going to put an end to it here before it goes from Russian to Arabic, which it kind of did, all the way to Indian, which it invariably would have. So... <laughs> Let's continue as Putin says, once they've taken out his claws and his fangs, then the bear is no longer necessary. He'll become a stuffed animal. The issue is not Crimea. The issue is that we are protecting our sovereignty and our right to exist. Okay. So I love this analogy. Uh, he's basically saying, I need to go on the offense. So trust me here, even though I went on the offense and we got a lot of sanctions, and our ruble is devastated, and our economy is devastated, we can't be sitting around eating honey and berries. We need to go get those some bitch piglets. Okay? We need to have our fangs and our claws and go get them. If it wasn't clear, the Associated Press makes it clear. He said by fangs and claws, he meant Russia's nuclear weapons. Damn. And the West wants to weaken Russia, he said, to win control over its rich natural resources. Uh, just to add a little bit more to the analogy, as NBC News here explains, he said, to chop Texas from Mexico is fair, but when we make a decision about our territories, it is unfair. Do they want our bear to become a stuffed animal? <laughs> okay. 
It's really obsessed with this teddy bear analogy. Okay. Uh, and I believe that Texas, uh, Texas uh, joined uh, the United States some time ago. Okay. And at the time, I believe that the Russians were also taking territory, and a lot of territory has been exchanged since. So it's a little bit apples and oranges. Okay. Now, and don't get me wrong, it's also not as clear as the West makes it out to be. So there was a legitimately elected government in Ukraine. It was toppled uh, by forces that are with the West. 4,700 people have died in Ukraine fighting those battles. Now, Putin claims that a lot of it is their territories, because there's a lot of Soviet-speaking people there. There are a lot of Soviet-speaking people there. Whether it's their territory is an entirely different question. And softened his stance a little bit in the press conference when he said, do Ukraine outside of Crimea should stay whole? Now, that seems to indicate that uh, the Russians should not take any more parts of crime, uh, of Ukraine, I should say. Now, uh, having said that, it, you know, the Russian people feel very grieved. They feel like that is their comrades that, that speak Russian, that are culturally Russian there, that they do need to protect them, and they do feel besieged. So are you ready for this? You know what Putin's popularity in Russia is? 81%. That's unbelievable. Could you imagine if our uh, dollar, our currency, was devastated, lost 20% of its value and continued to plummet, and our markets had crashed? Do you think we would have Obama at 81% approval rate? He would have been lucky to be at an 18% approval rating. Well, there's a couple of different reasons for that. Uh, one is that there isn't very much free media in Russia. So Putin has really crushed a lot of his opponents. So people don't even know what other choice they have. I mean, one of his supporters is going to say that almost exact same quote I'm going to give you in a second. Um, and the second reason is people love strength. And it's easy and hard times to say it's us versus them. You see, we're under siege. The West is coming for us. And look at what they did. And they're killing our people in Ukraine. 4,700 people have died on both sides, by the way. Um, and, but a lot of that is Russian-speaking people. And, they, and look at what they did to our ruble. And they're attacking us. You need a strong leader with fangs and claws to protect you from the piglets. In fact, Putin said at one point, we are absolutely capable of doing everything ourselves. OK, we don't need no stinking foreigners. And that resonates. Here's one of his voters. Uh, Valentina Roshpinkina says, I very much support Putin. Who else is there to support? She accidentally points out, without realizing it, well, he has a monopoly on the media, so you don't, of course, there's other people who support you, you just don't know about it. Right? So that's one of the problems here. Now, but the second part of the quote really backs up what I've been saying all throughout, not just for Russian politics, for American politics, for politics everywhere. Uh, she says, the country is moving in the right direction, I believe because he lifted up the army, he made the government stronger, people started to be a little bit afraid of us. It doesn't matter how bad the situation is. What people love is a strong leader. So if you come out and say, oh, I have fangs and claws, our economy is totally screwed, but that's okay, I will protect you. Oh, God. hey, yeah, all right. Yes, the bear, the bear, not the teddy bear. We will not be a stuffed animal. Here's another quote. For us, the most important thing is the army and then everything else. It's the most important for us that our country is a power. If we are not a power, we do not exist. So he plays those strings brilliantly, crushes the competition, and then uh, says to everybody after they went into Crimea. Look, you, the government in Ukraine being toppled is a good and open question as to how that went down, whether who was wrong and who was right, right? Russia coming in and going, oh, thank you very much, we will take Crimea. <laughs> it's less of an open question if you ask me. I mean, it certainly it could have been a better process for that uh, than what actually happened, right? Certainly the Soviet troops from time to time crossing the border into Ukraine, obviously helping the Russian separatists, is less of an open question. That has led to a lot of deaths. It is the territory of Ukraine. And once you start questioning those borders, there's no end to that question, right? And in the end, it has devastated their economy. It was certainly part of the reason. Oil is a larger part of the reason. Uh, and at the end, he says, well, you see that? This is exactly when you need a strong leader like me. 
So mission accomplished for Putin. The Russian people might be suffering, but he's actually in better shape than he's ever been. Amazing. Okay. Do I have time for anything else? All right, I'm going to do one more story. Uh, let's skip ahead to D'Souza. Jeb Bush is running for president. He says he's going to listen to everybody. He's going to go listen to his donors. Okay, that was that story. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, nothing surprising there. All right. In the good state of Florida, uh, I know one thing. They're against propaganda. Uh, they are among the people who complained when President Obama once went to a class. I tried to indoctrinate the students. You remember that whole hubbub? Yo, oh, Bob, I can't believe he wants the students to bow down to him. All they care about is indoctrination. Now, those same conservatives in Florida are saying that all the kids in 8th grade and 11th grade must watch Dinesh D'Souza's movie uh, espousing conservative ideology and attacking President Obama. In fact, according to the Tampa Bay Times, Representative Neil Comby, a Lakeland Republican, filed a bill seeking to mandate that all 8th and 11th grade students view the film America, Imagine the World Without Her. Okay, throughout the movie they attack Obama and they keep on saying, you know, America's number one. Dinesh D'Souza has done all these movies, they're all the same thing. Uh, the prequel to America was the United States. The sequel is going to be... The states, we still rock. Okay, so to give you a sense that I'm not exaggerating, let me show you a piece of the trailer. Imagine the unimaginable. What would the world look like if America did not exist. America in theaters this summer. <laughs> there is so parody, man. I mean, I, I couldn't have done that any better. America in theaters this summer. <laughs> but not just in theaters, now in classrooms, if the Republicans get their way, all throughout Florida, because if there's one thing Republicans are against, it's indoctrination. Young Turks. Turks, uh, Jing and Anna with you. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna die. These are hilarious. Okay. I can't, I can't get enough. I saw the monkey sitting on the TYT side. That was hilarious. I can't even. I can't even. <laughs> okay. I that one was going. Okay. God, I fucking love my haircut. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm looking at the... No, no, you guys don't understand. The hair, the last haircut I got was so bad, I always wanted to put it up in a bun. And now I just, I love it. I love short hair. I, I don't understand women's hair thing. I mean, like, they all look, this, like, relatively the same to me, but they're always, like, obsessed, like, this hair is great and that hair is terrible. I can't tell the difference at all. It's all about making sure it looks healthy and voluminous. Never mind, I'm already understood <laughs> the conversation. Okay, okay, um... So uh, I was showing that Dinesh D'Souza uh, movie trailer that they're going to make the kids watch in, uh, in Florida. It turns out Mikhail Guyton write, writes in, oh my God, we literally watched this and we're told that it's mandatory. Uh, my teacher then stopped and said this was crap and cut it off. Great teacher. Oh, Great teacher. we love that teacher. Give him an apple. Um, or her. Right. And plus don't. That's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ruth Iverson said, kids have to watch that movie? Where do they live? Glenn Becky Becky Beckistan? Otherwise known as Florida. Uh, Michael Schnell says, now Putin is talking about fangs and claws. All he needs is black hair dye and he's officially Count Dracula. <laughs> I'm amused by that. Um, no More Donations says, LOL, AJ English said Putin's three-hour presser was brisk compared to his previous ones that he's had. Um, and let's just end on two last ones here. Flint Stouting Tom says, Cenk, that's a Russian accent? 
Yikes. <laughs> okay, agreed. Uh, and Mr. Red Penguin says, I wonder what Jank would be like on S SNL. Mm -hmm. LOL. I don't know. Uh, I also wonder that. <laughs> okay, speaking of SNL, no, actually, Steve Carell's not from SNL. He's originally from The Daily Show. It's going to be our first story, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay, uh, let me say uh, the membership drive before we get to it, actually. Uh, TRTnetwork.com slash holiday membership drive gives you uh, one dollar, the membership for a dollar for the first month, mm -hmm. okay? People are kind of going nuts about it a little bit. They you know what's really cool is that a lot of people have tried it, so the promotion is kind of working and that it's getting people to take to sample it a little yeah. bit. And they're like, oh, it's kind of awesome. Yeah, our, you know, I, I will say this about our post-game shows. Oftentimes we have discussions that I will later regret in life. And I know it. As I'm, mm. as I'm disclosing really personal things about my life, I realize that I'm going to regret it in a few years. You know, I've gotten a couple of tweets about this over the last couple of days. People are binging in our post games. Yeah, they're going back in time and 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 watching past post games. They've gotten very explicit. <laughs> but it's like, look, with, with membership, you're not just getting post games. You get the whole two-hour show whenever you want. Yeah, so you can binge on any of it as you want, and you get the network shows too. So that's what I think people are realizing, because mm -hmm. otherwise, you either have to catch it live or you just in bits and pieces. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, you guys miss a lot of good stuff. Right. Tytnetwork.com/slash. <laughs> Holiday membership drive. Okay, next. All right. New Regency has just announced that they are putting a hold indefinitely on a movie featuring Steve Carell. Now, they were supposed to start filming this uh, movie. We don't know the name of it right now, but it did feature uh, a plot that involved North Korea and 20th Century Fox got a little afraid, and they decided that they would renege on their distribution agreement. And so a lot of this has to do with the Sony hack. Of course, the Sony hack had to do with uh, the interview, which upset the North Korean officials because it had to do with executing Kim Jong-un or assassinating him, I should say. And so now all of a sudden we have other production companies and distribution companies totally chickening out of movies because they're worried about anonymous hackers either hacking into their email system or possibly doing a terrorist attack. Okay. In response, I would like to kill, tell Kim Jong-un. Uh, here, come to me for a second. Hey, Sus. Okay, uh, you are not a god. Uh, you don't bowl 300 every time you bowl. Uh, you don't read minds. You're full of crap. Uh, and we will not be pulling this from any of the outlets we have. Okay, so like what, what, what these guys, I mean, what the, this is insane. Do you know that the North Koreans are constantly threatening America? Yeah. Like people think this is new. It's not new. Mm -hmm. We just just we didn't take them seriously before. They're, I mean, I guess it's because a lot of people don't read the news. That's our job, right? We read the news religiously. So I, I can't tell you the number of stories. It might be in the hundreds that I've read where the North Koreans are like, "We will destroy all of your cities. We will burn everything down. We are almighty. Bow down before us, and we will crush you in our infinite might. Don't you dare cross us." And we're like, yeah, pa ding, pa ding, pa ding. Now all of a sudden, Sony, Regency, Fox, they're all running for the hills. This is madness. The more, first of all, they are total chickens for letting this happen, right? So let's say that it's 100% certain, and the feds claim that they're 100% certain that North Korea is behind this, right? You're going to allow a dictator of a completely different country totally dictate what we do in our country when it comes to creative freedom and freedom of expression? That's insane. You shouldn't do that. I mean, I look, I get it. You, you're probably going to feel a little spooked after your email has been hacked into, right? And all of a sudden, all this personal information is being leaked to the presses. But at the same time, you have to have a backbone, and you have to understand that being manipulated by hackers makes you so incredibly weak. They're not going to do a terrorist attack. They're threatening you. I think they're empty threats. And honestly, I don't even know if I really buy that North Korea is behind this. I, I'll get to that in a second. But Steve Carell's a little pissed about this, and he should be, because he makes the same point Anna's making about creative freedom. He's like, that's what happened to creative freedom. And I saw this online, so I don't want to take credit for it. Somebody made a very good point. If we let North Korea dictate what we're going to do, as Anna just pointed out, then we are North Korea. I mean, that, it's crazy. What does it come to? Imagine now this... My point, imagine if it was a, a Muslim leader somewhere, a fundamentalist Muslim leader, uh, and the Ayatollah in Iran's like, okay, don't show that movie. 
And American companies are like, oh, okay, so we're so sorry, Grand Ayatollah. And they started pulling movies. And people were going nuts, right? right. I mean, that, we couldn't have that. That'd be, why are we letting the North Koreans do it? They're even less powerful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, look, and now to Anna's point. I, I know. I, I Look, not only is the Justice Department day saying it's North Korea, mm -hmm. okay? People have been saying it's North Korea all along. The movie, the interview is about North Korea. And now I've uh, been given several different articles about how the North Koreans have actually secretly been training people in Russia and China, and that they've been up to this for a long time, and they have Bureau 121 who's been doing this, and, it's, and so it shouldn't be surprising. I still don't believe it. There's something at play here. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some 4chan hackers who saw this story and they got super interested in it and they're like, let's play. Right? I mean, it could be anything. I, I, I don't know. That's speculation. I don't know if there's really any truth the, behind the, that. But it's just, for some reason, I don't know what it is. It's, it's more of an instinct. It's a gut feeling. I don't think that the North Korean government is really behind this. That's just my speculation. I don't know. I think it's I, probably very few of you have seen the movie Snowpiercer. But in one point, they realize it's a bit of a futuristic movie. Oh, my God, the guards don't have bullets. Okay? Now, I'm not giving much away in the movie because it happens rather early, early on. Uh, I think that's what's going to ha happen when we finally go into North Korea. We're going to be like, oh, my God, their guns were made of paper mache. Mm -hmm. like, so, and I don't say this just out of nowhere. I mean, it's not just that they brag about nonsense stuff and yada, yada. Um, it's that I talked to a North Korean defector, a woman that we'd covered on the show once. I met her in person, and she said when she, she went through this incredibly harrowing experience to China to finally get to South Korea. And so when she was in the South Korean airport, uh, when she got there, and this is really uncomfortable, but it, she, it's a true story. She drank from the toilet bowl because she thought, oh my God, look at all this wonderful water. Oh my God. That's the state that the North Koreans live in. She took the toilet paper and put it in her uh, bag, and she's like, oh my God, they left this valuable paper with flowers on it out. It must have been a mistake. I should grab this while I can. Oh my God, that's, that's amazing. She said when she got to the, you know, the border of South Korea, in, a, in effect, that it was like the border of heaven. She, she couldn't believe what was in it, right? And so people live like that in North Korea. And those guys have the most sophisticated hackers in the world. And I know leadership obviously lives a completely different lifestyle than the, than the citizens of North Korea. But oh, I'm still not buying that they're sophisticated enough to be able to pull this off. And then the Guardians of Peace, why did they call it that? I, it just, something about this story smells super fishy. And I, I know it's going to continue to develop. There's going to be some new development, a big development, probably next week, and we'll figure out exactly what's going on. Yeah, but it does literally seem Kim Jong unbelievable. Yes. Now, just a few more updates on the Sony hack story. President Barack Obama has responded to the Sony hack story, and he's urging people to not be fearful and to go to the movies. In fact, he told ABC News the following, we see no credible evidence, though, of any serious threat to theaters or some sort of terrorist attack against theaters that are screening the particular movie at issue. We'll be vigilant. If we see something we think is serious and credible, then we'll alert the public. But for now, my recommendation would be for, for people to go see the movie. Yeah. I, I'm mixed about this. Uh, I mean, I did a story in the first hour where Fox claimed he, well, why doesn't he just tell people to go to the movies? And then he, it turns out three hours earlier he told them to go to the movies. But it reminds me of the Bush line after 9-11. It's okay, everybody, go shopping. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to be comforting. I don't find it that comforting. I find it weird. So we're, we've really? become such like uber capitalists that... I don't... I mean, look, people, for better or worse, are concerned about it. I, I don't see it as like, oh, this is him trying to get us no, to No, no, I know, I know. I'm overpicking it. Yeah. I, don't worry about it. I mean, uh, generally, Anna's right. And of course Obama should say that. There's nothing wrong with him saying that. Yeah. And you should go to the movies. It's not like, don't worry about stimulating the economy. If you want to go to the movies, don't be afraid of these pricks. Yeah. Okay. Just go forward. I just feel like he can't win. Like, no matter what he says. If he doesn't say anything, he can't win. If he says, like, all right, we should be careful, we never know what could happen, people are going to say he's fear mongering. If he says, don't worry about, oh, look at him, pro capitalism, I mean, just leave the guy alone. So I, I re just reached two conclusions. First of all, that's it. I'm going to a movie on Saturday. You guys fucked. North Korea, you fucked up. Okay. Now I'm going to the movies. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, uh, to spite Kim Jong-un, you should all see Mattis Hell.
Mm. Okay, we will not be pulling mad as hell from the theaters, okay? I'm making a dramatic announcement right now. Go to madasellfilm.com and you can see it all across the country. I don't care what Kim Jong-un says. You will not intimidate us. Not here. TYT, too strong. You tell him, Jake. You're such a cheese ball. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Agreed. All right, let's move on to a very non-serious story before we get to a lot of serious news in the second hour. A British man reportedly spent $150,000 on plastic surgery and fillers in order to look like a specific celebrity. Now, before I get to that celebrity, I want you to take a look at his pictures and then try to see if there's any resemblance between him and a starlet. Take a look. Starlet. <laughs> oh, my Jesus Christ. <laughs> Dr. Evil? I don't, I don't know. Uh, Pharrell? Okay, so what? What Jordan, is... Jordan James Park is his name. He's 23 years old, and he underwent all of these uh, surgeries in order to look like Kim Kardashian. Oh, I, I've never, literally never seen a bigger fail in my life. Oh, wow, that's supposed to be Kim Kardashian? Wow. A hundred... Forget the hundred fifty thousand dollars. Apparently, he I don't. Is, by the way, I don't believe the hundred fifty thousand dollars. No, inconceivable. I mean, no, but look at the surgeries he had. So no, I no, believe no. he could. He could have spent. Believe it. me, I know a thing or two about plastic surgery and how much things cost. Okay, spent a considerable amount of money on my nose. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> there's there's no way that he spent a hundred fifty thousand dollars on plastic surgery. Okay, whatever. He apparently has money to burn. He wants to spend it on that. Who cares about the money? Look at what you look like now. I know. I actually. I, I feel really bad for him. He's got issues. He does, but dude, come on, man. I don't know. What do you want me to do? You want me to lay off? I mean, look at you. I know. That's cr um, but you're right. It's literally crazy. Then that makes us feel bad. Uh, thank you. Way to be a dad. I know. On this and that's why, look, with stories like this, you always have that conundrum, right? You, you want to comment about the way he looks because he spent a considerable amount of money to look that way, right? That's the whole gist of the news story. But at the same time, if you dig a little deeper, there are issues at hand. Be yourself, man. Be yourself. Or maybe a slightly better version of yourself, but don't go too drastic. You know, Irina was saying, our executive producer, that his eyes kind of resemble hers. But you, it doesn't, what does that mean? First of all, the eyebrows do not. The eyebrows look literally comical, mm -hmm. right? And second of all, your eyes are your eyes. You can't do plastic surgery on your eyes anyway. He tattooed his eyebrows. Really? I couldn't mm -hmm. tell. <laughs> yeah, the eyebrows I got that he did something with. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the actual eyes, but it, what are we talking about? It doesn't look like her at all. Does he at least put on a wig? I don't know. I, I don't know. Oh, this is so but, sad. Anyway, so uh, he's not the only person who has gone under the knife in order to look like Kim Kardashian. There was actually a woman who spent $30,000, 24-year-old woman, um, for the same reasons, right? So. I don't think she oh, looks wow. bad. She, no, she actually does kind of look like Kim Kardashian. She's pretty. And she's pretty and stuff, but, but again with the plastic surgery, different parts look comically out of proportion, like her lips. If you start looking at her lips too long, then you lose all attraction and want to run away. So I started thinking about like body image issues and, you know, look, all I can really do, because I'm not an expert or, or a psychologist or anything like that, all I can do is really use like anecdotal evidence and things that I've gone through to really comment on these stories and kind of give it a little bit of depth, right? It's kind of amazing what like people's fascination with beauty will do to you as a woman, right? Because my biggest thing recently has been like just going through like the most popular pictures on Instagram time to time. And the only thing that goes through your mind is, wow, I'm so inadequate. Because the, the, the thing that's considered hmm. beautiful right now, according to social media, is super muscular women with really, really big muscular butts and like super arched eyebrow. And like basically everything that I don't have, right? And so I'm like, I don't know, should I, should I just start squatting with like heavy weights on my shoulders as I'm watching TV? Like, do I need a six pack in order to be considered attractive? Like, you, all of those pressures really start to get to you. At first it's subconscious, and then you start to realize that you're very aware of it, and you almost want to go to extreme lengths to look a certain way. It becomes exhausting. I'm so relieved that I don't have to deal with any of that crap. Okay? <laughs> like, I, I look at, I realize that there are better looking guys than me. I'm perfectly aware of that. Yeah. And I'm so comfortable with it. <laughs> like I, I get... see them, I'm like, good for you. Have at it, Hoss. Yeah. I don't feel 
any pressure to look like that. I want to get to that point. I feel like at some point last year I got there, and then now all of a sudden I'm like, do I need to make changes? And I'm not saying like go under the knife, but like, look, certain images get pushed on you regularly, and then mm -hmm. no woman wants to feel like she's unattractive, right? So, like the difference sometimes between men and women is amazing, and of course it's also dependent on the person. Me, I'm unnaturally confident. Like, <laughs> I have the same unearned confidence well, that most Bush men are does. Like that. <laughs> okay, yeah. I look at my body with the gut and everything, and I'm like, looking pretty good. Imagine if people started change, getting plastic surgery to look like me. Yeah. Ah. Uh. Yeah, maybe some people will in the future. I don't know. <laughs> Things change. And that's another thing. Beauty comes in trends, right? So I remember, look, this is a personal story, but whatever, I'll tell you guys. I remember when I went in uh, to get a consultation about my nose, I asked the doctor, well, I told the doctor, like, I want a 90s nose. Like, I want a little slope. Like, I want you to make my nose significantly smaller. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no. He's like, that's super outdated. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you a nose that looks like you were born with it, right? And uh, I love that, doctor. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, like the big fake boobs, right? That's also something that's not considered beautiful anymore, according mm -hmm. to beauty standards, which, by the way, is stupid shit anyway. You shouldn't really pay attention to it. Like, now all of a sudden it's like, oh, you should have small boobs, but you should have a massive butt, right? Like, all <laughs> this is so <laughs> obviously know. trends. No. That, and then you put the giant butt injections in, and then... Oh my God, fashion changed. Now you need a tiny butt. No, I know, Oops. I know. Which is why at the end of the day, you should be comfortable with who you are. Ironic coming from me, especially since I made a change, but I think I made a pretty small change that helped mm -hmm. with my confidence. So. Right. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. What do you mean um, that's interesting? I didn't mean anything. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm just using it as a transition, honestly. I got real combative right but there. I, honestly, it wasn't even that interesting. Okay. I'm waiting for this to be the new face of beautiful. Wait for it. That trend is coming. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, uh, let's take a quick break, and uh, we'll be come right back and do some serious stories. All right, back on the Young Turks. Um, so lots of. Uh, Tweets ranging from funny uh, to serious. Let me start with the funny. Paul Preeb says um, about the hacking incident. Mm -hmm. I heard witness 40 admitted to the hacking. <laughs> if they had to, they'd put her on the stand, <laughs> right? Um, Sean Ferris says uh, uh, on Mad as Hell, I've seen it, loved it. Going to petition the Academy for the Oscar. Damn. Wow. Can you imagine? <laughs> Could you imagine? How cool would that be to go get an Oscar? Well, I mean, we didn't make the movie. Andrew would get the Oscar, right. but still. That would be amazing. Yes. Um, so, uh, Darian Glynn says, actually, Jank, a friend of mine uh, is trying to gain weight to look like you. Damn. <laughs> um, uh, Tom Zwaki agrees with me that he looks closer to Dr. Evil. Um, and now let me go to the serious ones uh, about... Uh, the story I did um, in the first hour, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot about the Pakistani teacher who sacrificed her life. There was, of course, a lot about uh, the 14 year old who lost his life here in 1944. Uh, and Togi's made an interesting point. He said, uh, Many white people don't understand that the police were never there to protect blacks, they were there to keep them in line. And so, that, look, no matter what you think of what's happening today, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of black cops in the country now too, of course, Latinos, et cetera. Things are, are, are not great. Uh, they've obviously improved since 1944. Uh, but still it's a perspective that a lot of people don't have, mm -hmm. which is that, yes, back then, the cops were not at all to protect African Americans. They were there as kind of like a, a, a mafia to protect whites and to keep the blacks in line, especially right. in the South. Not everywhere, but in a lot of places. Also in L.A., mm -hmm. you know, now it's considered a liberal bastion, but the LAPD was among the worst cops in the in the country, yep. right? And uh, in Boston and all these other places. So it's an interesting perspective when you think historically, the cops have never really been on the African American side. In fact, they've been against yes. them actively, right? So just one to grow on and. Um, and then Chris Bradshaw made a good point too. Welcome to the side of the greatest generation they never tell you about. 
right? And the people who had to live through that terror and and the best they could under the circumstances. And then um, and then Bree Hood said, "Damn, Jank, that that's twice in half an hour. You made me ball. You had me bawling in my house. The truth hurts. It should when it th when this is when we find. This is what we find." And look, so on that point, I mean, yesterday Anna cried about that story. Today I cried about the story, uh, but we got to do it, right? And it's that's the whole point of this show is to share the whole truth with you, right? Mm -hmm. Because we can't make informed and educated decisions unless we know everything, and and we're doing the best we can to present that to you. Obviously, we got the goofy stories, like that guy trying to look like him, Kardashian, and we have the super serious stories because that's the entirety of the news, right? Yeah. Okay, now, our members who make all that possible, uh, let me give you a shout out to Ryan Maidment, who is member number 1602, and Grant Kimberlin, who is member number 1153. So Ryan and Grant, we got a great post game for you guys today as well, which will be on the lighter side of things. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about male confidence. You talked about how you have unusual confidence. I'm going to make an argument that a lot of dudes do, and then I'm going to apply a personal anecdote to prove it. Okay, I'll one up you. So that's great. We'll do that in the post game. I will, we will also do because it's exactly the same thing we were talking about on old school last night with Jimmy and Ben, which you should check out. Yeah. Uh, I I'm pretty sure members get that in the podcast. So if you're a member, definitely check out old school. I think you'll really really enjoy it. Um, how I would act if I was single now. Cuz Ben was talking about my confidence. So I'll try some like we know what we'll do. We'll do role play. Okay. Oh, how's that for fun? Okay. Super fun. You're a single chick. I'm a mm -hmm. single suave gentleman. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. What happens? Okay. Today's gonna be an awesome post. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, now we move on to some of the serious stuff we have. Earlier this year, in June, a girl by the name of Jada, 16-year-old, was uh, brutally raped uh, by a number of men, or boys, I should say. And as a result, uh, some of the boys took a photo of her, and then they circul circulated it around the school. She was laying on the floor, she was unconscious, and she had her leg bent in a peculiar position. And once other students in the school saw the image, they started using the hashtag Jada pose and then posing like her in the photo. So they were basically bullying her after she was gang raped by a bunch of her peers. Now, she decided that she wouldn't hide behind closed doors, that she would go out and she would speak to the media and she would talk about what happened to her. And as a result, finally, months and months later, two individuals have been arrested for the rape. One of them is a 19-year-old by, by the name of Clinton, Onya Hialam, and uh, the other one is a 16-year-old, and since he's a minor, we unfortunately uh, do not have his identity. Of course, there's a policy where you, they don't release his identity. But I think it's important to show the image of the 19-year-old and kind of have a discussion about why, in this day and age, teenagers think, teenagers think it's funny when someone gets raped and it's okay to circulate a photo like that and make fun of it. Keep in mind that she claims, and of course, there needs to be a trial, and all of these things need to be, you know, um, you know, figured out. But she claims that she had a drink and that it was spiked, and then after that, she lost complete control, and before she knew it, she woke up and realized what had happened to her. Yeah, as we see with the Bill Cosby story, it's not like that's not possible. Uh, it appears that that's uh, something that folks do now. Uh, my guess is that a lot of people, and I'm trying to be as fair as I can. I don't know why I, I'm doing this to the people who did the obnoxious poses, not the people who raped her, but the people who did the Jada pose mm -hmm. uh, on Twitter, is that they uh, probably thought, well, she was drunk and she passed out and it's her fault, right? So they probably don't believe her story mm -hmm. about the, the drink being spiked. Now, again, that'll be adjudicated in court, and we'll see. But you have to understand how irrelevant that is. If somebody got drunk and passed out, that doesn't mean that you can take her clothes off and all rape her, right. okay? Be, like, so... You shouldn't pass out from drinking, and it's not a good idea for a number of reasons, right? But it doesn't give the guys in the room carte blanche to rape you. So how do you, come on guys, you gotta be able to see that. So wh what are you doing, doing the pose of the girl who got raped? Like, ha ha, she was drunk. Ha ha, she was, if she, okay, if she was, maybe, again, I don't know why, but I'm giving them such benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Maybe a lot of them didn't know she'd been raped. They just thought, that's a funny picture of a girl who's passed out. Which then, okay, then it's no big deal. But that's not the case. 
No, it's not the case. And another thing that I find amazing is that these guys were so brazen about what they did. After they had done this to her, they took a photo of it and then they started circulating it around the school as if it's funny. Like, haha, we just sexually assaulted someone. We just allegedly gang raped someone. And now we're gonna share the pictures with all of our peers and make fun of her and bully her just to add insult to injury. And I just wanna give Jada a lot of credit, okay? Because obviously rape is a super traumatizing situation and then you add the bullying to it. I mean, I don't know how I would handle that situation. I would probably wanna just crawl under the covers and not wanna be seen in public. She went out there and she spoke to the media and she's like, no, I don't want you guys to hide my identity just because I'm a 16 year old. I want you guys to use my real name. I wanna talk about what happened to me and I'm not gonna let this destroy me. And that is amazingly resilient for a 16 year old girl who went through something so traumatic. Yeah, and look, I think that uh, my guess that w is that the defense of these guys will be, oh, she consented. I'm sure that they'll say that, whether it's true or untrue, right? And again, that'll, they'll decide that in court. But another uh, defense that's done in public uh, among kids this age is, well, you know, she passed out, so it's not like I raped her. Uh, you know, she didn't say no. It's I didn't like you know hold her down or anything like that. She was passed out. But that's why we had these conversations. That's rape. That's rape. That she she just because she didn't say no, it doesn't mean it's not rape. If she's passed out, she can't give you consent. Yeah. It's not another kind of rape. It's just rape, rape, okay? And so I bet you that if when they were laughing about this and sh showing it around school, I bet you that none of them said, hey, look, we raped this girl. Yep. I bet you every single one of them was like, ha ha, she passed out and then we all had sex with her, high five. No, 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 that's really bad. That's what you gotta understand, that's what you gotta get through your head. That's not okay in any way, shape, or form. So I started thinking about what it is about these students that makes them so different from the kids I grew up with, right? Because when I was in school, the thought of someone making fun of a rape victim was inconceivable. No one would ever do it. It was taken very seriously. And I was like, what, what was it about my upbringing and their upbringing that made us different from these students in Houston, right? Mm -hmm. And then I started to really think about it. Like when we had comprehensive sex education, we didn't just talk about like what happens with the birds and the bees. We talked about all sorts of things, including rape what it means to rape someone, what it means to sexually really? harass someone. What it, yeah, look, California, since it's a blue state, I would argue has the best comprehensive sex ed. At least that's what I was exposed to when I was in school. And I definitely thank my very conservative mom for letting me take those classes because it taught me a lot, you know? That's really interesting. Yeah. I grew up <laughs> at a significantly different time than you did, which is uh, interesting in and of itself. But uh, I hesitate to say I'm from a different generation, but but I went to high school in the 1980s yeah. in New Jersey. We didn't have any of that kind of conversation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So there was no talk of rape in, in sex ed at all. We had sex ed, but it was just, you know, what happens, yada yada, birth control, which was good and necessary, but no, that those conversations were considered way too uncomfortable to have. And, and in my school, which is a large public school, I could see this. Yeah. Right? I, I, you could. I, yeah, I don't see it like you do, like, whoa, that would never happen. See, but that's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering, and look, this is just me trying to figure out why things are different in, in some school districts and different in others. Maybe because we were exposed to that kind of education, we understood the weight of something like rape, right? Yeah, and, I, I'm telling you, I mean, growing up with the kids, they I, I was on the football team. Uh, I didn't go to those parties because I was a dweeb, but, <laughs> but I'd hear about them on Monday morning. And everybody said, ah, oh, she was so drunk, ah, she was so drunk. And mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe she was drunk and they were having fun and they had sex and that's perfectly normal. That's what happens all the time, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Or she was so drunk and she passed out and they did whatever and they're still laughing about it. Yeah. I don't know, right? So that's why this is a lot more common than people realize. That's why we need to have this conversation. Right. So the kids get it through their heads. That's not okay. Yeah, agreed. All right, uh, we do have some good news for you guys today. Obama has granted clemency to eight uh, people who are in prison right now for nonviolent drug offenses. Now they're in federal prisons as a result of these drug offenses. And again, they're nonviolent. So this is all great news. Four of those individuals were actually set to die behind bars because they were given life sentences for drug-related crimes, okay?
So, uh, according to the Huffington Post, Obama has now commuted the sentences of 18 people in total, which a White House official noted was more than either President Ronald Reagan or George W. Bush commuted during their administrations. I mean, I love that they use that as a comparison, as if that's like something to be proud of. Like, wow, those conservative presidents didn't commute as many people as Obama did. <laughs> wow. Anyway. Well, for a while, Obama's record on that was really, really poor. Yeah. So the fact that he's getting better, that's why they even bothered to make the comparison. Right, exactly. Because he used to be worse than that. And for those of you who are wondering, like, all right, so what exactly did these people do? Why is it that they were behind bars, four of which were behind bars for life? Well, according to uh, Deputy Attorney General James Cole, these were all nonviolent, low-level offenders who have no significant criminal history nor ties to gangs or organized crime. Keep in mind that all eight of these people have already served at least 10 years behind bars for their drug-related offenses. You know, it's nuts what we do in this country. I mean, we've talked about all the different cases where people don't go to jail. I mean, just la yesterday, I did the story of the Democratic politician in Virginia who had sex with an underage girl, his prison sentence, his jail sentence was 12 months, six months is suspended, so only six months. But during that six months, initially it was uh, from, he can leave the jail from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. What? So how is that jail? And they're like, yeah, that seems, that's a bit much. Okay, fine, you can leave the jail for 12 hours at a time. How is that jail? How is that jail, right? That's sex with an underage girl, and, and here, Guys, low-level drug offenders sitting in jail would have rotted away in jail for the rest of their lives. I'm going to go ahead and guess that these eight people, uh, the four people especially that got life sentences, didn't necessarily have the resources necessary to fight their case. Get, of right? course. So it's all about, it's all about whether or not you have the money or the power. And if you don't have the money or the power in this country, you're level two in our justice system. Now, credit where credit is due, uh, and Obama's done some really good things over the last couple of days, and this is among them. So he's getting much better on the issue of clemencies and commuting sentences and pardons. So um, here, here, a uh, lot we don't agree with on Obama, but when he does the right thing, you really got to give him all the credit in the world. And, uh, and, and it takes some courage here, because of course the Republicans will yell at him. They'll say he's soft on crime and he's pro-drugs and all this stuff. And you got to get past that. And, and, it, and he is, so that's great. So credit to President Obama. Absolutely. All right, let's take one more quick break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about sexual dysfunction among women and whether or not there needs to be a prescription drug for it. Back on Young Turks. I mean, we should save this for another post game, but we were just talking during the break. My, <laughs> I get into fights all the time. I come home with black eyes and all this stuff. And if Pro did that, I would have like, I'd be like, whoa. What? Let's have a conversation for like 24 hours straight to figure out what happened, right? My parents were old school and they were like, oh, you got no fight. All right. Anyway, what ups? <laughs> okay, dinner time. Okay. That's funny, man, yeah, how uh, time changes. All right. It's Natasha writes in, uh, Anna, don't change anything else. You're perfect. And Cenk, you're quite handsome yourself. Don't change a thing. Mm. I just picked that tweet out of a hat. I mean, right. I just yeah. randomly happened to read that one. Um, now... Uh, so MattisHealthFilm.com, I don't know if today or yesterday was the last day for the Vegas uh, screening for you mm -hmm. to be able to buy tickets. But check it out. Uh, we're all going to be in Vegas. We're going to have a great time. We're going to drink a lot. MattisHealthFilm.com, that's January 8th in Vegas and then January 22nd, I think it was. I'm going to be down in Miami also having a good time. Uh, check that out. MattisHealthFilm.com, not just in Vegas and Miami, but all over the country. Uh, so take a look and uh, and and watch the movie. It's actually a great movie. And um, I saw Dave Kohler in the office the other, uh, just earlier today, and mm -hmm. he had his finger on the button, and we had to talk him down. For the dollar membership for the rest of the year, he's like, should I end it? Should I end it? I'm like, Dave, don't do it. Don't do it, man. You got to wait till New Year's, OK? He's like, as soon as I hear it, three, two. OK, so it's a rare opportunity, dollar uh, membership for the first month. Jump in it uh, mm -hmm. and check out the Young Turks <clears throat> at your leisure. Okay, let's move forward. All right. As you all know, there are certain drugs available on the market for men who have erectile dysfunction, but there aren't any drugs available for women who might have sexual dysfunction. And some people are arguing that this is sexist, which I mm. think is interesting because we have discussed a female Viagra and how it is a ploy by pharmaceutical companies to basically sell 
these types of drugs to women and make them think that they have sexual dysfunctions when they probably don't, right? Now, The Atlantic wrote this really great piece kind of covering it from a lot of different angles, and they talked about the sexual inequality aspect of it, which I'd never thought about, and I'm not really sure I'm buying it yet, but I want you guys to have the discussion with us. So, The Atlantic talks about how uh, Viagra is different from this female drug. It's known as flibinserin, okay, flibinserin. And I would, unlike, I would come up with a different name, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, Flippin' Saren is an unfortunate name. Okay, Viagra so, rolls off the tongue. Right, and it sounds a little bit like flipping the bean, so that's also weird. <laughs> anyway, okay, keep going. All right, so unlike Viagra, for example, Flippin' Saren is taken daily not only in anticipation of sexual activity. Viagra addresses blood flow while flippin' sarin works on the chemicals in a woman's brain. So it actually impacts the dopamine and serotonin in a woman's brain. But there are issues that you should take into consideration. When a woman is not, you know, in the mood to have sex or she usually is uh, not interested in having sex, there could be biological factors at play, there could be psychological factors at play, there could be societal factors at play. So it's really hard to pinpoint what's going on with the woman. Is she in a relationship that she's unhappy with? She's probably not going to want to have sex with that guy. Does it make sense to market a sexual dysfunction drug to her? So that's one of the many issues that plays a role in this, in this issue. In this and story. already the first part of the story is interesting because if you want to have a drug that works for guys, you direct it toward their penis. If you want to have a drug that works towards women, you direct it towards their head. That's hilarious. I didn't think about that. And also keep in <laughs> mind that sexual desire and sexual arousal for women are two completely different things. You can have no desire to have sex, but you could still be aroused, which means that your body will be ready for sex, okay? You might get a little moist down there or whatever, but you might not actually desire the sex. So women are a little more complex in that way. <laughs> women are definitely more complex than men. <laughs> If if the if the flag is up, we're ready to go, <laughs> right? They're like, what else is necessary? Right. Oh, are you in the right mood? Well, I'm already flying the flag, aren't I? <laughs> okay. So where, where's the question? Yeah. So look, my concern is that this kind of drug is again just a ploy for pharmaceutical companies to diagnose women who might just be stressed out and they don't want to have sex for those reasons, right? Diagnose them with some serious psychological or, or sexual dysfunction and then push drugs on them. But I do think it's also an interesting point that there are options for men, but there are no options for women. And if you are in a marriage or in a relationship and you have no sexual desire, that could really destroy the relationship, obviously. No, I hear you, man. Uh, so there's good arguments to be made for, for trying this. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when we're messing with the chemicals in our brain, yeah, I'm a little concerned. Yeah. Because yeah, if you're taking a drug every single day that manipulates the serotonin and dopamine in your brain, I think it could have some long-term issues. And think about this, then there'll be pressure from guys uh, to have their wives keep taking it, mm -hmm. right? And then that's another set of problems, right? And where do you go from, here, take this uh, drug that will help you get stimulated to take this drug, I mean, there's some Bill Cosby line in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But, and so I feel uncomfortable saying that. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Interesting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I feel a little uncomfortable saying that, but at the same time, um, look, it's probably going to help people too. So it, it's there's no easy answer here. I think that it might be important to have that option available for women who might really struggle with sexual desire and it has nothing to do with their relationship, it has nothing to do with stress, it's really just an imbalance in their brain or something that's really making them not want to have sex, right? The option's important to have, but I think if anything, the more important thing to do is have the proper regulations in place to make sure that pharmaceutical companies don't have the type of influence they do have on doctors, on the diagnostic statistical manual. You know, that's one of the reasons why so many people are overprescribed so many prescription drugs. Pharmaceutical companies are in bed with a lot of these doctors and with the people who basically write the DSM. So that concerns me more than having a drug available for people who might seriously have this issue. In the end, the pharmaceutical companies are going to come up with a drug that makes doctors prescribe all of their drugs. <laughs> okay. I mean, we're in some weird way have turned into a country of zombies, it, you know, all hooked up to different kinds of drugs being led around by pharmaceutical companies we're not even aware of, you know? 
that you're because the doctors get incentivized to push these drugs on us, and then our kids are walking around with all these different buttons pushed in their heads, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it helps you, and there's a re look. It's not all bad. It's not all evil, and a lot of these drugs help people, right? And then you get a bad combination in there, and for a lot of people it doesn't work, and it's counterproductive. And I just and the other part of it is sometimes it's just okay to be human. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. it's okay to be, uh, you know, down for some time. It's different from massive clinical depression, don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, trying to say that that's, to be flippant about that, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's okay if you can't completely concentrate. That was also human back in the day. Yeah. Now it's like, okay, I'm going to take this drug to, to go up, and this one to go down, and this one to concentrate, and this one to relax, and this one to sleep, and this one to make sure I don't sleep, and then you're taking all this shit. Okay, or why don't you... Stop taking all of them and just be a human being. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's easier said than done, especially when people get addicted to these types of drugs, you know? Especially when you get addicted to the high of being on a particular prescription drug. Um, there was another point I wanted to make, but I'm forgetting about it. It's an important one. Mm. Oh, th this is what I wanted to say. What I found really interesting when it came to like clinical trials and certain panels about this uh, female version of Viagra, the FDA actually had like a group of women for like a summit and they were kind of discussing sexual dysfunction among, among women and these women were talking about how they had issues with sexual desire and everything and how important it was for them to have this option. Later on, uh, it turns out that one of the uh, reporters that was covering this was very skeptical about some of the answers that the women gave. It seemed as though they had been coached by the pharmaceutical company to say certain things to the FDA so the FDA would approve this type of drug. And also Elle magazine wrote this really long feature about a woman, it was like a profile about a woman who was dealing with sexual desire issues and then she did a you know clinical trial and all of a sudden it changed her life, it was great. Later on they found out that the pharmaceutical company was working with her and they wrote this piece. So. Keep all those things in mind, okay? There's a huge profit motive here, and that could severely influence the way things are prescribed to people. And I think my main takeaway from this story is that I invented a new term called flying the flag. Mm -hmm. I made that up. There's no such thing, <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> anyway, um, so if you get the whole show and you remember, you also get the uncomfortable pauses that we edit out of the YouTube clips. <laughs> Okay. All uh, right. Any more stories? Yeah, one more? Yeah, let's do Pat Robertson. Okay. Damn, we're already out of time. It's crazy. Yeah, crazy, dog. Crazy. Okay. Pat Robertson loves answering questions from some of his viewers, and recently someone uh, wrote in and talked about how uh, congregants at his church are not able to have relationships with one another, okay? It's against the rules of the church. And Pat Robertson was outraged by it. He felt that this gentleman needed to stop any type of association with his church because, of course, you should date people that you're going to church with. That's like the classy moral thing to do. And then, I love that because Pat Robertson's like, wait, you tell me I can't fuck a woman inside my church? He's like, then why am I going to church? <laughs> what the hell is this whole thing about? He's such a funny, like, misogynist in, in a lot of ways. Not that having sex with a woman in church is misogynist, God bless. Right. But we've covered the stories. And, and any time, um, like, the male order of things is challenged, his, all of his, like, antennas go up. He's like, what? what? <laughs> we can't have sex with the, with the girls in the church? What the hell is this uh, kind of satanic church you're going to? So after he starts talking about that, he addresses... The gay community. Okay? Oh, good. And good. it's always I'm fun. So much from this. Always fun when Pat Robertson um, addresses the gay community because he's a real expert. He really is. Now, just keep in mind that he said the following with absolutely no sense of irony. Take a look. You know, those who are homosexual uh, will die out because they don't reproduce. You know, you have to have. Yeah. Uh, heterosexual sex to reproduce. Same thing with that church. It, it's doomed. It's going to die out because this is the most nonsensical thing I have heard in a long time. This is absurd. God has made us to be in families. God has created a desire of men and women to have attraction to the opposite sex so that they will reproduce and have children. 
I love how I love how Pat Robertson, who's about to fall over and die any minute, okay, is talking about the gay community dying out because they can't reproduce. And by the way, speaking of which, so which way is it? Are people born gay or are they not born gay? Because you say that it's a lifestyle choice, right? Hmm. Interesting. And if they were gonna die out, why are they still around? <laughs> As humanity, around. we've been around for quite some time. And they're still here, so I don't know. I think you'd have to put some thought behind that theory, Pat. I love the idea that you'd tell him that, and he'd be like, "Oh, damn! I didn't think about that, dog." He's like, "Yeah, you're right, man. I, I'm sorry, guys. I've been saying all this stuff about gay people the whole time. It turns out they didn't cause 9/11 or Hurricane Katrina. My bad." I don't. I mean, did he think that a bunch of people decided to be gay like five years ago, and then like? <laughs> He's like, "Don't worry. Let's just wait him out." <laughs> He's crazy. But I love how pro-sex he was there. He, man, I haven't seen him that offended in a long time. Your <laughs> church won't let you fuck the girls inside? What is this? Amazing. <sighs> okay. Let's end on that note. That's fun. That's fun. Okay. Uh, for the members, uh, in the post game, uh, we'll talk about confidence between difference between men and women or something along yes. those lines. Yes. Right? And then Anna and I will do our first ever role play. I don't know if that was a good idea, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye bye. <laughs>Okay, so it's just really funny because if I'm in a non committed, non monogamous relationship, my understanding, and it's always my speculation, that the person that I'm having this situation with is sleeping with other women, right? And so, or seeing other women, whatever. And so I had this conversation with Christian recently where we were talking about when we were in that weird gray area where we weren't monogamous and like we had like this undefined relationship. And he's like, you didn't see other people. And I was like, are you kidding me right now? Of course I saw other people, a lot of other people. I'm not saying I slept with a lot of other people, but I went on like a billion dates, I was going out, I was having fun, like, what did he think? I was just sitting at home waiting for him to call me? He's yeah. crazy. No, that's what I thought too. No, yeah. and then you know what he said to me? He's like, I don't know, I just tend to have that effect on women. And I was me like, too. get the fuck out of here. No, no, it's funny, Christian and I had identical um, stories. I was in an open relationship for a little while with one of my girlfriends, and I assumed, of course she's not doing anything, right? I mean, hello, open or not, she's with the hombre, oh you know? Oh my god. And uh, with the jefe, I mean, it's over, right? <laughs> and I found out later, no, she was going out with like seven times more guys than I was yes. going out with girls. Yes, yeah, and we, we, we got into numbers, and like, you know, he told me about the people that he was dating, and he got specific, and I was like, okay, cool. And then he's like, you, well, you tell me. And I told him, I was like, well, there was this guy, and then there was that Tinder date, and then, then there was that Tinder date. And then I was seeing this guy for two months while I was seeing you. Like, just very detailed. Did that blow his head up? It blew his mind. He can't, right. he can't get over it. Like, he's not upset, obviously, but he can't he's get upset. over it. Yeah. You think so? <laughs> oh, he's totally upset. He can't. But it's well played, because now he's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to keep you. <laughs> it's just so funny because again I knew that there would be other girls like a guy is not wanting to commit to you because he wants to mess around with other girls so yeah, yeah. no it's true but we're stupid we always are overconfident yeah right so we're like oh yeah, bliss. and then you find out the reality that she was dating half of LA or where whichever city you were in and you're like mm -hmm. So funny. I love it. I uh, know, but I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. There was nothing wrong with that. <laughs> okay, is it time for role playing? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So, why you're uncomfortable by this? No, I mean, no, I'm not. Go ahead. Okay, so this will be fun. Uh, now, I have tried to keep a blank mind. Like mm -hmm. yesterday, I thought about it for a second after we had the discussion in mm -hmm. old school. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, but I don't want to practice it because that'll ruin it. Mm -hmm. It has to be a scenario like this, okay? You and I have just walked into, name it, elevator, bar, whatever, and I have to go, in order for this to be realistic, I have to do it cold. All right, okay? let's do it. So I'm going to try to, like, not pick you up, but like, this is the conversation that I would have, well, to eventually pick you, okay? Mm -hmm. Assuming okay. we're busting. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Go.